Okay, hello. Thank you all for coming out to another uh, another of our Race, Ethics, and Powers project talks. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Jerome Clark. He is an assistant professor at American University in Washington, D.C. He writes on technology ethics, the critical philosophy of race, and 20th century social philosophy. He's currently working on a book manuscript that reformulates the theory of racism in light of algorithmic harms in contemporary institutional life. The project prominently features a reevaluation of W.B. Du Bois's critique of empiricism in governance and social science. Today we'll be hearing his talk, The Data of Blackness, and with that, I will let you take it away. All right, thanks. Uh, much thanks to Dr. Paris and the lovely organizers here at the Center for Ethics. Uh, I'm privileged to share with y'all and those tuning in live or later on YouTube some words I've been cooking as of late. Uh, I do have a PowerPoint, um, though halfway through, uh, I'll stop using it. Uh, and that's because I learned last night that graphic design is not my passion. Um, so today's talk reconsiders a critique of empiricism in black social philosophy, one launched a century ago by American sociologist W.B. Du Bois. Specifically, I lay emphasis on an animating metaphor that displays less of his condemnatory attitude to statistics than his attempt at interpreting and marshalling what we may call the force of information. Here I find Du Bois's, uh, here I find du Bois contemporary for dealing with our present data and machine learning uh, dilemmas. Because he just about pioneers American quantitative social science, innovating methods of data collection and visualization with the sole aim of accounting for the place of black Americans vis-a-vis -vis their enveloping hostile American society. Today, we'll see how his work is in some unpleasing ways, but in some good ways too, continuous with that of Galton and Pearson, those eugenicist statisticians whose development of correlation and regression undergirds much of our actuarial present. My title, The Data of Blackness, recalls the fifth chapter of revolutionary psychiatrist Brands Fanon's Black Skin, White Masks, today's most uh, spectacular forms of what's called algorithmic racism are its relapse. In this naming, I'm returning us to the first English mistranslation of Fanon's chapter, which emphasized the fact or objectivity of blackness, as opposed to the chapter's real aim to betray how said facticity interprets, or not interprets, interrupts the properly translated lived experience of the black by jarringly transposing all claims of and moves to subjectivity, historical, or in the case of vital force, to the predicate, such that black subjectivity is unavoidably burdened, fraught, oxymoronic. The nub of my paper is the claim that a sophisticated account of algorithmic racism and most other technical ethical ma uh, matters must begin at and work through the unitary fact of the matter, the given, which these days goes into and comes out of machines. If we begin elsewhere, we come no closer at answering the impossible question that all the world seems to ask Du Bois. How does it feel to be a problem? How does it feel to be a problem? Mm -hmm. Before I get going, I want to start with an inoculation. Race and statistics go together. Even when humanists and hermeneutic social scientists articulate this fact as worthy of our suspicion, they cannot help but depend on it. Constructivists of varied stripes rely on correlation to sing signal the lingering reality of racial hierarchism. Their unifying claim is that histories of exclusive social coordination, irrespective of the exact categories and reasons involved, result in the fastening of social classifications, ethnicity, race, sex, with myriad other variables, such that a system concerned solely with the latter may still be, in an important sense, uh, profiling. That racism by proxy variable is still racism. Prominent these days is a necropolitical variant by Ruth uh, Wilson Gilmore. Racism in her work names risk. The state sanctioned or extra legal uh, production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. As we will see, uh, what kind of what makes this definition necropolitical is an instrumentation or putting to work of this death risk. 
In academic philosophy, Paul Taylor's definition of races, signaling his radical constructivism, captures this tendency by designating the probabilistically defined populations that result from the white supremacist determination to link appearance and ancestry to social location and life chances. Here, it's the regulative idiom or norm of white supremacy that brings about the raced set. And put together, these definitions could be seen as furnishing cultural scholar Sadia Hartman's account of racial slavery's afterlife. Skewed life chances, premature death, incarceration, and impoverishment. Now, each of these thinkers conceive of racism, maybe especially anti-Black racism, as more an overriding political principle of a state-sanctioned white supremacist determination than the given or sought for evidence of injustice. Therefore, they have a more substantive concept at hand than racial justice as, uh, un uh, as fairness. Racism is not simply that raced people are treated worse. What is it then? To answer that, I say we pause on Hartman and Taylor's invocation of the term life chances, for it opens up an organic supposition that I'm convinced unites uh, Du Bois and probably these scholars themselves. When the sociologist Max Weber coins this concept of life chances, he first does so with a Darwinist tongue, spelling out the latent struggle for existence of human individuals or types for life chances, which he defines as the relative struggle for uh, which he defines as the relative opportunities or uh, for individuals during their own lifetimes. Weber claims that the struggle for life chances takes place without meaningful intention of conflict. So think of survival, um, a social survival of fitness. Now, his is a transcendental account, Weber's identifying a basic category, life chances, with which all sociologists ought to interpret social relations. There is no specification of a political norm or rule governing what opportunities are granted to which individuals and which types. The same cannot be said of any of the Black thinkers mentioned. Implicit in Weber's category is a question of the individual or human types perpetuation. Life chances are the available options for self-reproduction, at most basic feeding and sheltering oneself. This Darwinist notion of chance not only flags the social selection of attributes over and above lifetimes, so like artifacts and customs, but also the individual's agential capacity to determine their own life. Notably, this idea shares its concept, or at least rhymes with, the eco-psychology concept by William Gibson. Um, and this is used oftentimes in computing uh, when considering artificial agents, actually. That being affordances. Those possibilities for action that are available to agents in their environments. Now to cut to the chase, both affordances and life chances implicate an agent and it surrounds as if the dyad were a handshake. Agency, artificial or human, is always a forced choice in that you are given choices to choose amongst. What's suspicious in Weber's account is that we don't see how social selection is itself selected, how Weber's category is itself a contingency. In addition, additionally, uh, by keeping white supremacy in frame, the black thinkers above remind us that people make the relevant environments and those environments guiding ideas that bestow these differential predictable boundaries and promises to people. My addition is that if we neglect this etymology, we paper over how what we call systematic racism today is far more a matter of fitness than justice. And I take it that Dr. Inder Marwa, who's gonna be here in like a month, from what I understand, uh, he's gonna share some of my interpretation uh, as he explores Du Bois's affinities with social Darwinism. If you're holding your breath, uh, because we're talking about Darwin and you know, kind of dicey, uh, please don't, I will account for the deficiencies with these views. Uh, but we should be clear that uh, most of our 19th century faves had a pinch of those eugenics particles. And we inherited them in our own ways of thinking uh, the world. So with that said, let's turn to a scene with which you might be familiar. During her graduate studies, Black computer scientist Joy Bolamwini jury-rigged a set of software development tools to create a face recognition system she called Aspire Mirror. Unfortunately, her mirror failed to detect her face's contours an issue she learned to resolve by donning a white mask or tagging in a white friend. Afterwards, she coined the concept, the coded gaze, to capture all comparable instances of gendered and racial insensitivity involving learning machines. In their 2018 paper, 
gender shades, Wolin Weenie and Timnit Gebru, who then co-led Google's ethical AI team, cautioned that the coded gaze could result in someone being, quote, wrongfully accused of a crime based on erroneous but confident misidentification of the perpetrator from security video footage analysis. Such was the case. of Black Detroiter Robert Williams. Arrested in 2020 by Michigan police after their facial recognition system identified him as a burglar. <coughs> Jeez. But neither was Williams the actual thief, nor did the system's proprietor, DataWorks, consider their technology sufficient as probable cause for arrest. Nonetheless, the algorithm to Detroit's law enforcement operated as an investigative shortcut. The upshot of a local covenant between businesses and police entitled Project Greenlight. Companies participating in Project Greenlight can functionally jump the queue on police assistance by installing on their properties surveillance cameras. Live video data are then fed into the department's real-time crime center, whose platform for aggregating and analyzing data is the spoil of a public-private partnership with Motorola Solutions. And so I'm gonna leave it to someone like Michael Sandel, uh, or one of those other folks to show how that entire predicament is kind of uh, bananas. <laughs> um, through DataWorks' algorithm on Motorola's platform, face data from feeds are compared to face data from public databases, including license and mugshot database, uh, data sets, until a number of potential identifications, sometimes hundreds with scores of probabilities, are sent to a detective. Whereas Bolognini's case reverses Fou uh, Foucault to remind that invisibility is also a trap. Williams's arrest, given his functionally fungible face, reveals an increasingly panoptic city. Plausibly a laboratory for other North American cities, though we'll leave the conspiracy for other folks too. Last year, uh, Black Detroiter Horsha Woodruff was falsely arrested while eight months pregnant by officers using the same technology. Black Atlantan Randall Reed was wrongfully arrested for a crime in a different <laughs> state in a county he never once ventured on a misidentification. In Maryland, Alonzo Sawyer. In New Jersey, Niger Parks. In the interrogation room, after booking him and recapturing, and you know, when you're getting booked, your image and your fingernails are uh, captured, put into the system. And that's a data trail that's difficult to expunge. Officers show Williams a snapshot of the burglary he allegedly committed. Williams puts the photo beside his face and says, I hope y'all don't think all black people look alike. <laughs> Now, there's surely something wrong, as in unfair, about a system that disrupts and jeopardizes a life course in an unfounded arrest before cataloging said course for system development. There too is something wrong, as in distorted, about a concept of wrong that cannot register that victim's experience of disruption and jeopardy. In a recently published memoir, Bolognini writes, sitting in my office late at night and coding in a white mask in order to be rendered visible by a machine, I couldn't help but think of Frantz Fanon's black skin, white masks. I was reminded I was still an outsider. I left my office feeling invisible. How far can we stretch that association? Can extant theory adequately explain these fungibility dilemmas? To answer, let's situate Fanon's uh, intervention. Although um, altogether his corpus posits three coextensive gradations of black racialization the epidermalization of the black body, the petrification of black embodied activity, and sociogeny, uh, the totalizing influence of an anti-black European culture on the psychology of its constituents, even those with black bodies who then come to figure themselves as culturally exiled. That Fanon's focus uh, moves from this figurative black uh, to a more broadly colonized analyzand in the, uh, you know, the wretched of the earth can be explored in the Q&A. Um, especially as it may bear on present day uh, crises. Epidermalization in its crudest sense is a pre-reflective process by which the apprehended dark-skinned body is substituted with an emotionally and conceptually dense facade. And this proxy of blackness represents animality, um, excessive sexuality, non-personhood, an unreflective null point of ethical life. The concept explains how black bodies are suffused with a peculiar cultural baggage wrought from past and present expropriation that weighs so heavily on the, on the intuitions referent that it ultimately blocks 
the Black's claim to self-determination of any kind. Fanon describes the epidermalized as being locked in an overwhelming objectivity, which leaves not a self-conscious human, but a consciousness in third person. In 2015, Simone Brown remixes this theory a bit by formulating what she calls digital epidermalization. The exercise of power cast by the disembodied gaze of certain surveillance technologies that can be employed to do the work of alienating the subject. By producing a truth about the racial body and one's identity or identities despite the subject's claims. Her concept refers to a biometric process whereby, quote, bodies and their comportment are rendered as digitized code. And on the surface, digital epidermalization describes not substitution, but a productive extraction of an already braced body. And the sensory apparatus at hand is not the visual organ engulfed by present society's racialist normativity, but a sensor hooked up to a machine. Her analysis raises the question of what makes this alienation distinctive. Since possessing digital photo documentation just is a requisite for access in contemporary society. I mean, I had to like do the, not only did I have to get my face uh, kind of captured to get into this country, but I also had to, you know, carry a pa uh, passport. We are generally stuck if we do not carry lines of biometric information on a card or pamphlet featuring our camera captured facial image. And many today, trans folk, ward seeking liberation, et cetera, suffer a dissonance between their claims to identity and state profile. Understand this, Brown refines the distinction by stating that digital epidermalization is specifically subtended by what philosopher Lewis Gordon calls white prototypicality. What Gordon says is an existential solipsism in which a patronizing view of blackness, I'm quoting him, as point of lack reinforces an internal consistency of whiteness that makes it appear as complete. And a uniting feature in post fanonian scholarship, despite its many quarrels, uh, is this dependency of a European non-Black and or white ethical life, symbolic order and or worldview on Black objection of some kind. To exhibit white prototypicality, Brown cites Wei Gao and Heizo Ai's 2008 paper, Face Gender Classification um, on Consumer in Images in a Multi-Ethnic Environment. Therein, the scientists develop a decision tree algorithm to classify the sexes of human faces in photographs. The algorithm is conceived as so. The initial input node uh, kind of receives numerical photographic data, pixels, and extracts faces from that data. Face data are then sent to other nodes that classify facial features, normalize these features in 32 by 32 pixel batches, and the endpoint classes faces uh, as either male or female. What Gao and I really discover is that their decision tree classes, uh, what Gao and I really discover is that different faces from different ethnicities have different sex constant features. Mm -hmm. As their dis decision tree classifies all African faces, African faces as uh, male and all Asian faces as female, mm -hmm. while sorting white faces far more optimally. Gender Shades, Bolomwini's project with Gebru uncovers a similar form of intersectional bias in some of the prominent corporate um, rec image recognition systems. Uh, though most of those use the now prominent and dominant uh, neural, neural network architecture that you might be familiar with. And for what it's worth, the question um, of, okay, yeah, sorry. And for what it's worth, the question of, is it a lack of diversity in the data or a faulty uh, machine causing such bias? The answer is typically a kind of, uh, is both, right? Uh, with other factors involved. So to resolve this issue, Gao and I developed another node for their system that first determines the ethnicity of the face data before the machine goes about its race consistent sex classing. Now Ga Gao and I's paper does not imply the functional dependence of whiteness upon those races designated as abnormal. In fact, the, engineer, uh, the engineers resolved algorithmic bias by themselves developing a machine to impose a race annotation under a makeshift taxonomy of racial difference that they come up with. So as to align their machine with a goal of proper identification. One may wish to argue that the boundaries of an optimally classed whiteness make recourse in some way to other races misclassing. However, per this specific citation, this claim may be unwarranted. And grounds for it is not what Gao and I find. 
Even so, Brown's notion could still be clarifying. But to better account for what may be called digital epidermalization, I think it's worth quoting Gordon and Paul. He writes that, Fanon is taking you on the task, uh, first formally identified by W.B. Du Bois in 1897, though I'm going to say a little bit earlier than 1897, that from the standpoint of a culture premised upon anti-Black racism, Black people have no point of view, lack an inner life. And Fanon's insight, shared by Du Bois, is that where there is no inner life, no inner subjectivity, where there is no being, where there is no one there, where there is no link to another subjectivity as ward, guardian, or owner, then all is permitted. Generally how it's taught and thought, Fanon's account is vertiginous. Epidermalization is a riff on a Lermitian concept, the corporeal schema. And the corporeal schema is kind of this function of integration between ones like bodily sensations or feelings and their perceptions. A process that Fanon calls a quote, actual or effectual dialectic between my body and the world. For neurologist John Lermit, the body world relation that begets a schema, a kind of a priori, let's be real, it kind of gets exploded in some cases of neuropathology, whereby one's own body may be rendered unfamiliar to them. Fanon conceptualized racialization as such a disorder and claims that the Black's body schema is replaced by a nauseating epidermalized racial schema. As described in a, a scene of dizziness on a railway carriage, which I'll now quote. In the train, it was no longer a question of knowing my body in the third person, but in triple. And let's you know keep an eye on this third person. In the train, they left me not one, but two, uh, but two, three seats. I was no longer enjoying myself. I was no longer discovering the feverish coordinates of the world. I existed in triple. I occupied space, bare objectivity. I went to the other, which is kind of like a seemingly self-possessed move, and the other, evanescent, hostile, but not uh, opaque, so transparent, absent, disappeared, nausea. Here, Fanon is incapable of experiencing intersubjectivity, that co-objectification where those who lock eyes understand each other as self-aware, possessing an authority to determine whether each other's accounts of objects are justified, that each gaze respects the other as a check and balance on itself. Fanon can't objectify the white other as a fellow subject, for Fanon isn't an object worthy of respect. And in that, his attempt at subjectivity fails, for the other isn't looking at him, but a figment. And in this weird, static, a social dialectic, he gets queasy, you know, to be a little reductive. By now, we may see what we could add to Brown's discussion. Digital epidermalization would have to be not an affordance, but a constraint, whereby one cannot but act and perceive themselves in the way that the racist society interprets them. A coercion that feels as if the world pulls the rug from under your feet. Remember, Du Bois's question is, how does it feel? To be a problem doesn't just feel unjust, but one feels unwell. Denied subjectivity, fungibility, hyper or invisibility, these disruptions hurt. Epidermalization isn't the fact of being identified contrary to one's identity claims. It's also the consequent injury that accompanies the incapacity of identifying yourself otherwise. And for Fanon, that means your failed attempts at trying to be what you are not, a non-Black subject. In history, uh, so it goes. This is a disorienting herd, which signals your powerlessness in appropriating, objectifying, and making use of not only yourself, so your body, but also what's in your environment, that, nat uh, that natural and social ecology in which a false effigy, an archive of all the worlds of repressions, appears in place of you. So case in point, Bola Mwini cannot appropriate the technology that she made, a problem that doesn't seem to be a mere skill issue. Leaving home for work, Williams, because his social environment has integrated a faulty technology, one that wasn't voted for, um, but I'm gonna, again, leave that for Michael Sandow, is arrested on his driveway, brought to a standstill where resistance, even out of curiosity or shock, could be fatal. An open question is how do these failures, this black atypicality give rise to and reinforce a solipsistic whiteness or non-blackness? And I reckon there may be pessimists in the audience online, um, and, you know, I'm going to disclaim that I might not give a satisfying answer to that question, but, you know, I'm blessed because pessimists don't really expect to be gratified.
<laughs> okay. So before we move on, you might be asking the question, whose fault are these wrongful police accusations? The individual cops, the department, or the machine? I think here's an instance might be interested in blame to get something that can approximate repair, right? Compensation, what have you. However, as a problem for thought, we shouldn't just loiter in whose fault, but rather ask what permits this? Claiming racism here would be to curb thought of it because uh, disruption, this disruption is augmented. Officers don't randomly stop and frisk Williams, but triangulate him. They seek out specifically him. We have to admit that to some extent, the technology authorizes this. It's here where we must point to a social theory um, such as like Ruha Benjamin's uh, category, the new Jim code, which characterizes the institutional uptake of technologies that reflect and reproduce existing inequities yet are legitimated without question as impartial. That detectives just take for granted this technology, whatever it uh, tells them. Sophia Noble tracks the same phenomenon under the heading technological redlining and laments how uh, digital data and computational method are socially tantamount to verity in the face of conflicting evidence. And Williams might add, in the face of a face that doesn't even look my, like my face. From a black feminist vantage, these sociologists document how these information technologies maintain, if not multiply, pre-existing injustice and they deaden po political contestation and they pave the way for tech firms unchecked power consolidation. And they identify this irreflexive trend as a crisis tendency, one which, if unimpeded, will cause catastrophic results, uh, not only for race populations. And it's here where I think we ought to turn into boys. Um, so like part two. But I'll also chill on the So let's start with a provocation from Ruha Benjamin, that our computer systems are part of a larger matrix of systematic racism. This view follows from Benjamin's assumption of a socio-technical perspective, a term brandished in virtually every politically inclined AI and data ethics work today. Benjamin neatly sums up the socio-technical view in two postulates. One, that any given social order is impacted by technological development. And two, that social norms, ideologies, and practices are a constitutive part of design. So we're a kind of reciprocity, right? Her socio-technical system is a reciprocal version of a dichotomy found in arguably every form of social philosophy since the late 18th century. The opposition between technical capacity and societal tendencies, and is often depicted in uh, determinate and genetic terms, right? With one um, force constant and the other force variable. So uh, for instance, in the tech determinist mode, uh, you have a society structure or superstructure its habits, norms, and values are an epiphenomenon of an incessant technical progress, right? Think Moore's law or those predictions that machines will reach and surpass our capacity to adapt to our own environment. What mustn't go without comment is that when figured as a reciprocity, this dichotomy feeds forth unique meta-theoretical questions that pretty much go unaddressed in critical tech scholarship today, despite all of it hinging on this undefined social ontology. Specifically, if computation, regardless of its use case, is so laden with innate legitimacy as to appear un incontestable to, say, a detective, one should ask, incontestable to whom? Are Benjamin and Noble themselves exempt from this illusion? What enables them to identify a phenomenon that seizes others like a spell? By what standard should social phenomena like the new Jim Code be evaluated as problematic? Just because it's racist? And um, how does an underlying racialist principle even persist in our technology? Here I have two wagers. First is that Du Bois' social ontology should be an inspiration for filling in that conceptual gap um, that let, that's kind of like left behind by those questions. And two, and this is more a kind of a historicist polemic, um, which I know that there's some Du Boisians in the audience, and so maybe we could talk through this in a uh, Q&A. Du Bois thinks of society as alive. In the uh, draft notes, of The World of Black Folk, the third chapter of Du Bois' unpublished book project, The Wounded World. He speculates as to what black people the world over ought to make of World War I and asks plainly, quote, is there a black world? Do black people today form a world, a conscious social organism aware of itself and its parts? 
So again, we have this question of self-consciousness, right? This, uh, as we know, kind of undergirds Du Bois' uh, work as well. And though this haunts him, he's declarative, not leaving the question unanswered. He says, yes, the growth of the Black world has been spiritual rather than physical. This answer, I would go so far to say, is fundamental to basically everything he's written. In this section, I'll show that when faced with the same dilemma plaguing Fanon's work, Du Bois just assumes that the racialized Black is in history, is the subject, and he doesn't really bother with defending that claim. And while there's these excellent papers out there uh, on Du Bois's commitments to like a value-free ideal in social science, it just is the case that his assumption of Black historical subjectivity is a political axiom an evaluation that undergirds his social, scientific, and later political work. And that's a claim I'll soon defend. What makes this axiom of Black historicity political is the contention that Black people, excluded, if not forcibly ejected from America and the larger world's social institutions, where in this case, if we're talking about society as a social organism, um, the institutions are its organs. Black people have their own fun functional institutions and ought to develop them. This position entails the capacity of Black people to conserve the Black race, despite his day's Darwin-inflected prognoses of the race's imminent execution or extinction, uh, which Robert Bernasconi, among others, has identified as the real context for those early works by which we know Du Bois. So why then does Du Bois adopt a society organism analogy so central to what he contests? My interpretation, uh, which I share with Trevor Pierce down at UNC Charlotte, is that Du Bois' idea of race soul or spirit is organismic in structure, which is to say that he was always accounting for the black race, despite its internal and geographic differentiation as a living societal animal within an environment. Pierce thinks that after 1920, the biological framework drops out in Du Bois' work, that ideas of social organism are replaced with more hermeneutic concepts, such as world. And we might add, after a serious encounter that Du Bois has with Marxist capital, evolution gets replaced with revolution. Even so, what are we to make of the claim in his last unpublished autobiography, written at the young age of 90 years old, that, quote, what I saw in the Soviet Union was more a triumph, uh, was more than a triumph in physics. It was a growth of a nation's soul the confidence of a great people in its plan and future. So to use the language from before, the growth of a communist nation is spiritual rather than physical. And as we can see in that quote, Du Bois doesn't merely isolate his idea of soul to race, as one might assume from a cursory reading of his early work. And so two quick notes before I move on. And I might need more water. Um, so number one, Du Bois's distinctive language of soul and uplift are at times conceptual vehicles for a dubious eugenics to which Du Bois commits into his old age. Uh, so in 1948, uh, so he's like 80 years old at this time, he, uh, he kind of, uh, he has a speech, which is known in the literature as the guiding hundredth. And in that, Du Bois revises his earlier elitist call for race leaders to uplift the uneducated black masses likely because at this time he was a card-carrying communist who understood the black proletariat as having fewer reasons to betray the race by siding with capital. Basically never addressed in the literature is this chilling scratched out um, bit in the archival copy, and I could pull it up afterwards, but you could find it online. And so it's scratched out, so he probably didn't say it out loud, um, where he just lets loose and he writes, quote, we must prepare for future manhood and womanhood. We must deliberately plan marriages. We must guide selection of mates by emphasis on physique, heredity, and brains, with less stress on color and beauty. Okay, so we should probably not lift any of that from old Billy. Like, that's not something that we're at all interested in. Um, yeah, exactly. So, um, and number two, by heeding my mentor, Amy Allen, and the decolonial work she draws on, we, all sh we also shouldn't lose sight of how Du Bois' reworking of Darwinism might bind him to an account of historical progress that smuggles in a reifying chauvinism, articulating where, uh, wherever we are now as an improvement on whatever came before us. So like a mythic uh, pre-modern, which is to say non-Western past. That is after all the infantilizing tale that Du Bois himself opposes. And we definitely should not uncritically defend Du Bois here, even despite his careful attention in demonstrating the irrationality of 19th 
and 20th century America, which sees itself as a fit, open society, adaptable to all challenges, um, but it undermines itself. It goes against its claimed promises of pro uh, progress in its unyielding obedience to racist ideals. Even when Du Bois is exalting the genius of Africa and a diaspora, he slips into a meliorism that we will probably still want to question. Though what we can learn from him is to not let go of history. Because to do so is to keep out of sight the neglected hurt and work of those whom history has brutalized, which as a sociologist, Du Bois can't do. His views are certainly materialist in a kind of path-dependent sense, but to use the phrasing of today's critical theorist Rahel Yegi, Du Bois thinks that societies as organisms are not only given to us and naturalized as, you know, as if our customs and our ideals uh, become second nature, but also, and more importantly, that societies are made by us, so given and made. So while Du Bois is susceptible to a critique of chauvinism, he, as a mentee of pragmatists, finds that the uplift of the society's soul is not a unidirectional learning process, but an experimental process, which I think is like, for what it's worth, uh, an equally solid translation of the old Hegelian trope of learning process. Even if we depart from Du Bois' chauvinism and racialism, what we can lift from his view, judiciously, I must emphasize, is a theory of social relations as mutable in its self-consciousness, as second nature, which is a view that I think links Du Bois and Fanon, actually. Because, I mean, sociogeny, the highest scale of racism that I said about earlier, just is a concept of second nature. And I think that's patently obvious. I would go so far to say that the body world dialectic in Fanon more than just rhymes with this organism environment chiasm that haunts our probabilistic theories of affordances and life chances. Okay, so that out of the way, I'm gonna move on to the man of the hour. And here we can get a sense of what Gordon means when he says that Fanon repeats Du Bois. So Fanon's moment of train sickness surprisingly echoes Du Bois' own account of misrecognition 50 years prior. In the unpublished essay, The Afro-American, written around 1894, so earlier than 97, um, as he returns to the state from a kind of postdoc in Berlin, Du Bois also describes blackness as being locked in objectivity. But the words he uses are that the eponymous black, quote, finds his life path strictly hedged in. Just like Fanon, he opens this piece with this autobiographical overture that kind of reads like existential phenomenology. Somehow, also traveling by train in Europe, I guess that's what you do if you're a black guy in Europe. Um, and so, you know, Du Bois receiving innumerable stares. He's eventually approached by a man who launches into small talk before complimenting Du Bois' accent and command over a language not his own. The European then plays a guessing game. You are from English India? No, I'm American. Ah, uh, yes, so uh, South American, of course. I have a cousin, no, I'm from the United States, North America. Indeed, but I thought, wait, were you born there, might I ask? Yes, and my father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather. Huh, is that so? Excuse me, I thought from your color that I am of Negro descent, Du Bois makes clear. Slowly but surely, the acquaintance realizes that he is, quote, face-to-face -face with a modern problem. And in common, however, with the rest of the European world, the acquaintance had always thought people in the third person. Du Bois, of course, describes his own misrecognition uh, of self not as a bout of triplopia, but as double consciousness. Not triple, but double consciousness. Which likely speaks to Du Bois and Fanon's different intentions. I mean, both kind of saw their life's work as political, despite their respective handles on clinical and scientific norms. Um, both speak to this heteronymic intrusion of a racist social principle upon the capacities of the black. But with that said, both kind of voice differing tolls in circumnavigating and or resolving those race issues. And I can talk more about that in the Q&A. Du Bois is perhaps best known in academic philosophy for his conservation of races. And we should remember that prior to its status, this is a speech, prior to its status as a political manifesto or late 20th century academic controversy, conservation is a research warrant. Du Bois is, um, okay, so like in 1896, uh, the year prior, Du Bois begins his investigation of Philadelphia's majority black seventh ward, which prototypes the sociology that he then conducts under uh, for the like, next following decades. 
He felt as if he had to underwrite his research in, uh, with a backing theory and method. And conservation is just one of a series that overshadows the remainder. A saturation, which at its worst severs this philosophy of history from its practical realization in empirical and interpretive scholarship. In his 1940 autobiography, he has like 20 autobiographies, Du Bois reflects on how his work in Philadelphia subverted the intentions of its commissioners. This is a long quote. The fact was that the city of Philadelphia at that time had a theory. And that theory was that this great, rich, and famous municipality was going to the dogs because of the crime and venality of its Negro citizens. And Philadelphia wanted to prove this by figures, and I was the man to do it. Of this theory back of plan, I neither knew or cared. I saw only here a chance to study a historical group of Black folk and to show exactly what their place was in the community. So if y'all remember reading Conservation, Du Bois finds races to be spiritual. That is not defined by skull, gene, or tongue, but by a shared history, uh, reactivity, and a collective striving to realize common ends, what he calls ideals of life. So his is clearly a purposive or teleological concept of race, which may sound ridiculous, but when you read the study of Negro problems, which is a speech on the Philadelphia Negroes method, and it's also published in 1897, you kind of get a sense of his reasoning. In it, he defines immediate object of sociology, social problems. A social problems for him is, quote, the failure of an organized social group to realize its group ideals through the inability to adapt certain desired lines of action to given conditions of life. Social problems fundamentally are unsuccessful strivings. And uh, he kind of articulates these as metabolic problems of fit between organismic functions and environmental forces action and conditions. And he adds that any resolution of a social problem is tantamount to, quote, social growth. That laborious and often baffling adjustment of action and condition, which is the essence of progress. So if social problems are these issues of dysfunction, progress implies crisis resolution. The overcoming of challenges to a race or social groups while functioning, it's regular execution of its shared principles. The eponymous Negro problem is Du Bois's metonym for a plexus, so like a bunch of social prox uh, problems, plaguing Black America. And he cautioned that use of this general category of Negro problem is not an excuse to complete its many reference. What nonetheless ties together and underwrites all Negro problems in America is a reality that all Black Americans, quote, do not share in the national life of the people, are not an integral part of the social body. He finds that Black Americans instead share but one bond of unity, and I would say a negative unity, that inaugurates the race as a race, since their bundle problems stem from, quote, the fact that they brought them, um, that these pro uh, problems grouped themselves around those Africans whom two centuries of slave trading brought to the land. All these Negro problems constitute the afterlife of slavery, skewed life chances, incarceration, impoverishment. So one pragmatist conclusion, unexamined in like pretty much all Du Bois scholarship, is that ideals for him function as solutions to social problems. It should go without saying that if racial blackness designates a shared experience of exclusion, logically, that alienation cannot originally serve as the race's own ideal. The black race's existence implicates a higher, or to use maybe like an Aristotelian ordinal uh, concept, you know, higher American subject. Hmm that identifies blackness as an object of knowledge, distinct and separate in kind from itself. An instance of such abstract scientific cognition is Philadelphia's theory of black crime and banality uh, that threatens the city's well-functioning. It's going to the dogs. The Seventh Ward was at the time an available scapegoat for Philadelphia's dysfunctions only because a certain concept of blackness and its ensuing practice resolved higher uh, crises. So Du Bois kind of plays history, uh, historian even this far back and reminds that 17th century America faced a contradiction between the nation's increasing need for labor and the legal controversy of the status of its unwaged laborers. However, in cooking a set of laws for these laborers, the question kept getting raised of what distinguishes indentured servants from black slaves. In turn, what developed were these legislative forms of expropriation, locking in a kind of ontological conceit of black slavery into the law, the black codes. Afterward, you have all these new phenomena that begin to uh, present 
emancipated and enslaved bl uh, blacks as quote, and physical, economic, and moral danger. Namely the nationwide increase in literate, baptized, landowning black folk, right? Uh, and many of them were emancipated because their mother uh, was white. And that's something we can talk about later. Mother. Right. And so that's actually, let, let's quickly talk about right now. Um, one aspect of the Black Code is that uh, if your mother is Black, you are Black. If your mother is white, you are no longer Black. And therefore, you are legally emancipated. And this was the case in several different uh, mm -hmm. states. OK, and one might say, OK, here is a moment where you have an instrumentation of the Black as a reproductive object, uh, a, a person whose like, entire function is to make more slaves. Okay. And that's kind of a key point in uh, Black studies today. All right. Okay, so this, these like new emancipated Negroes, plus the surge in maroon communities, and you have these organized slave rebellions, all of this coincide with what Du Bois calls the distinct beginning of group life among uh, Negroes. And thus, the first unifying ideal of, black, of the Black American race is not as political, um, oh yeah, the unifying ideal of the Black American race is its political freedom, understood as a comprehensive civic enfranchisement and not merely the end of this slave status. Black people need to have rights, they need to be just part of the social organism like everybody else. In the same, American society rearranges its social environment to resolve crises that prior uh, resolutions instigate, all of which lead up eventually to a totalizing reproductive crisis for the nation, the American Civil War. In the postbellum period, Du Bois notes that Black ideals shift from freedom in general to suffrage because emancipation was incomplete. Black folk couldn't vote. And thereafter, from suffrage to book learning, as suffrage was uh, once won was stymied, as you know, probably like in the form of literacy tests. In quote, uh, uh, in Strivings of a Negro People, the third note in 1897 and the first draft of Souls of Black Folk, Du Bois describes each of these ideas, quote, as separate, all-sufficient panaceas for social ills. And so this is important. Social problems are articulated as pathologies that actually give rise to the present ideal and form of the race. Freedom, suffrage, and book learning each are to Du Bois, quote, vain dreams of credulous race childhood, not wrong, but incomplete and oversimple. The racist... Uh, Yeah, okay. All of them, in his view, lead up to this prom uh, promising ideal of his day, which he championed, fostering the traits and talents of the Negro, or in his words, race conservation. In the study of Negro problems, he claims that the internal group capacities of Black Americans have been inhibited by their external environment, which was designed under, quote, the widespread conviction that no persons of Negro descent should become constitutive members of the social body. So the racist belief that motivates this ruinous environment, these ghettos, and the predominant scientific racism, all of this must be taken into consideration as the first limit of the social study of Negro problems. Since the program's scope, after all, could not go further than the acceptance of a mostly white public and patronage, such as Philadelphia. Which is to say, Black sociology, what for Du Bois just is like an institutional mode of self-consciousness, is limited by the ideal of the surrounding American society, anti-Black racism. And in this text, Du Bois writes that the chief axiom of his work and so, what sociology should be is that, quote, ne uh, the Negro is a member of the human race. And as, uh, and as one who in light of history and experience is capable of a degree of improvement and culture is entitled to have his interests considered according to his numbers in all conclusions as, as towards the commonwealth. So to the trained eye, races as fraternities of a universal brotherhood um, is a Darwinian tenet, postulated at the very beginning of conservation of races. And again, here we have an assumption of his science, right? So, Here's where I think that a value neutral Du Bois is kind of confusing. Though he does know that his pol uh, that politics, you know, like social reform, should not guide sociology, the science, as Du Bois articulates it, is, is antithetical to the exclusionary prejudice that it studies. If this discursive context of Du Bois's work is taken into consideration, this axiomatic constraint is not merely a descriptive postulate for these scientists, but a polemic. 
which targets both anti-Black prejudice and the positivism of his era's social science, as we'll now see. And here I'm going to just quickly turn to two texts, one where he critiques empiricism and the other where he spells out something that could help us understand digital epidermalization. And then I'm going to close up shop. Let's leap to 1904, when Du Bois pens the unpublished, though now influential, sociology hesitant, a justification of his philosophy of social science. Therein, he targets uh, Auguste Comte and Herbert Spencer, two founders of sociology that influenced both him and the racist statisticians he opposed. Both famously defined uh, social science, basically sociology, as social physics. Abided by, and they both abided by this organism society analogy. They also considered human progress in an evolutionary mode. Though the last two, um, evolution and organism society, is actually more uh, associated with Spencer than Comte, though Comte did have these views. In sociology hesitant, Du Bois claims that sociology, if anything, must be a study of human deeds, practices. Comte and sociology aimed and claimed to be a knowledge of men, and it sought to understand, as Du Bois puts it, the vast and bewildering activities of men and the lines of rhythm that coordinate certain of these actions. However, Comte substituted human action, uh, which should be an object of induction, but he never really focused on human actions. He substituted human action with society. In turn, Du Bois finds Comte to be strangely hesitant as towards the real elements of society. And by virtue of his generalities, Comte's generalities, uh, which I can say more in the Q&A, Comte reads those, uh, Comte kind of reads as those with whom, uh, with whom he disagrees most, an idealist of the German kind. <laughs> Spencer also finds himself critiqued for similar reasons. Du Bois agrees with Spencer's evolutionary view. Um, and Spencer's the guy who people talk about when they say social Darwinism. But Du Bois takes issue with the practice of Spencerians, specifically American ones like Frederick Hoffman, who mostly mobilized imperfect historical data and, quote, depended on hearsay, rumor, and tradition, vague speculations, travelers' tales, legends, and imperfect documents, the uh, memory of memories and historical error. In the end, the social Darwinists did not add to, ex uh, to ex existing knowledge, and they kind of just made far too much recourse to the help of this biological analogy. Even this move, however necessary following Darwin, kind of failed because analogy for Du Bois implies knowledge, but it does not supply it. In short, reliance on a crude evolutionary biology resulted in the Spencerian only being able to talk around the human deed. Top-down regression analyses on populations, such as what, uh, what was found in uh, uh, Frederick Hoffman's work and what is actually the context for conservation of races, these regression analyses could only ascertain trends, not these rhythms that Du Bois is talking about. So social evolution was supposed to be the scientific law like gravity, but it becomes in the hands of the Spencerian an article of faith. Du Bois thinks that neither camp can claim human practices as their object because they're afraid of criticism from those they claim as allies, natural scientists, but also from those they rebuke, idealists and uh, even religious folks who believe in free will. Du Bois thinks uh, one ought to flatly face the paradox. Sociology must admit and subsume both criticisms because we live in a world of natural law, but also that human, quote, men have almost universally assumed that in among physical forces stalk self-directing wills, which modify, restrain, and redirect the ordinary laws of nature. So to flatly face the antinomy of natural and social law is to declare at the beginning of one scientific venture the hypothesis of law, and the assumption of chance. And uh, Du Bois says that one must seek to determine by study and measurement the limits of each. The latter assumption has it that the world of physical law, quote, is peopled by things capable uh, to some degree of certain actions, inexplicable and incalculable, according to the laws of natural science. And a sociologist with this in mind can refuse the false choice of nature versus nurture. He says that within the primary rhythm of physical forces and physical law appears again and again a second rhythm, which differs from the first in its more or less sudden rise at a given tune, in accordance with prearranged plan and prediction, and in being liable to establish and change by humans uh, according to a similar plan. And here we get the moment where he says, ideals are sequential. 
They switch from one ideal to the next. And a uh, kind of example of primary uni uniformity is the death rate of a society. And of the secondary uniformity, the operation of a woman's club, an institution. And we shouldn't confuse the two rhythms because if we do so, we try to uh, use the same methods to study these two uh, objects of sociology, we're going to make some mistakes. And here we get a better sense of what Du Bois means when he says throughout his earlier essays that color prejudice, the ultimate source of all Negro problems, could only be uh, studied by way of its concrete manifestations. By articulating the second uh, rhythm of social freedom within the first of natural necessity, he presents soul as having a privileged place within the realm of nature's causal laws and forces. Social law, though natural in the first instance, is, however, a matter of indeterminate force, right? So he's a pragmatist, right? And the pragmatists were all about free will. Social law is a matter of indeterminate force, which can only change course by way of a sudden emergence of another social law. And this is Du Bois's justification of his claim in conservation that the natural scientists cannot grasp the spiritual distinctions between races that are based on physical differences, based on physics, but transcends them. Inductive statistics, as with other methods of the natural scientists, um, natural sciences, plays a central role in sociology, but only to capture this first rhythm. So the Philip Negro has these chapters with uh, data, and we're going to talk about them in a little second, right? Um, which, if my reading holds, is but the immediate manifestation of the group's social life. They are, at most, measurements of life conditions and cannot themselves uh, furnish the Spencerian claims of racial extinction, as they were kind of doing at the time. Oh, the black, pe uh, black people, the death rate is high, and so any minute now, it's gonna, they're gonna be <laughs> goners. At the beginning of the Phil uh, Philadelphia Negro, he admits his diffidence with regards to, quote, the ineradicable faults of the statistical method to the even greater error from methods of general observation. And finally, those issues stemming from, quote, personal bias, some moral conviction, or some unconscious trend of thought. Statistics, in turn, require delicate, standardized implementation, given that Black social needs were so inconspicuous in the official records, largely due to this unwitting uh, shared inattention to Black people. The viability of statistics in coming to understand the Black American population was disproportionately dependent on, quote, intensive studies carried on uh, def uh, definitively limited localities by competent investigators in accordance with one general plan or set of methods. And so you have these chapters in Philly Negro uh, called the conjugal condition, right? Or education and illiteracy, which are concerned with primary rhythm. They're co it's concerned with these data points. And in these chapters, he compares city and institutional records with the books, pamphlets, and survey testimony of Black Philadelphians. And here we get the secondary and a, re a refrain throughout uh, Du Bois' study is how official records from census, health, and penitentiary data sets inform the city's disparate distribution of care, punishment, and surveillance. Flawed, racially motivated empirics were only part and parcel of the Seventh Ward's environment. And they were subtended by the idea that the Negro is something less than an American and ought to be not considered much more than what he is. So I think I'm going to skip a little bit uh, but he has this chapter um, where he talks about uh, the Philadelphia model, which is a, a mode of policing that actually is also talked about in Discipline and Punish. Um, and the Philadelphia model, right, the Eastern State Penitentiary, uh, Du Bois articulates how this system and its institution kind of takes on a weird value. So he's basically, to be sure, he's like, he's kind of accounting for the Panopticon, like, 50 years before uh, uh, Foucault. 191 of the black prisoners classified were imprisoned on account of, quote, natural and inherent depravity. Whereas others emerged from, quote, homes badly situated and badly managed by poor laws and inefficient administration, economic exclusion, which admits Negroes only to those parts of the economic world where it is hardest to retain ambition and self-respect. And most importantly, quote, that indefinable but real and mighty moral influence that causes men to have a real sense of manhood or leads them to lose, as, uh, to lose their aspiration and self-respect. Du Bois is presenting the panopticon as dispiriting. One of the supposed spoils of the protests, okay, yeah, sorry. 
Okay, let's uh, return to Project Greenlight. To recap, the case concerns a partnership between businesses and police whereby cameras on uh, private properties constantly stream video uh, to the police department. A report in 2020 uh, by Michigan State University's Justice Statistics Center concludes that there is no clear and consistent uh, indications of crime declines associated with the beginning of this system. Yet, one, uh, yet in the wake of the protests, 700 businesses have voted with their financial resources to enroll. Enrollment in the program is in fact increased in the wake of the protests against police brutality. One of the supposed spoils of those protests for the city though, was that the police department would no longer use facial recognition technology in conjunction with Project Greenlight. Yet in a conversation with journalist Laura Herberg, Detroit Police De uh, Commander Ian Severy acknowledges that though the approved green light cameras supplied by private vendors have no facial recognition software installed in them. Quote, the department st uh, takes still images from Project Greenlight footage and puts them into facial recognition software anyway. So nothing's changed. And that's evident in Portia Woodruff's wrongful arrest last year because that interview happened in 2022 and Woodruff got arrested last year while eight months pregnant. Du Bois does not rebuff the use of statistics. Here I'm closing up a little bit. In fact, he understands and mobilizes the disclosive force of information. And now I kind of want to turn to some photos uh, I wanted to share at the end. So because these machines are privately owned, these facial recognition system, um, systems with training data hidden behind intellectual property law, one finds a troubling situation in which these, mo uh, these models can uphold vastly different racial taxonomies, such that it's unclear if it's right to explain these cases with a concept of white prototypicality. So um, there's this really cool paper by uh, Zaid Khan and Yun Fu, and they trained a set of classifying algorithms on different prominent benchmark data sets, all supposed to be these like top of the line. These are diverse data sets. If you train your systems on them, uh, they're not gonna have these problems. And then he, they set these classifying algorithms uh, to classify novel photographs of individuals. Their hypothesis being that, quote, every facial image data set uh, uses racial categories, encodes a different distinct racial system. Khan and Fu found an overwhelming consensus amongst their classifiers in identifying individuals as black. So the classifiers can say like, oh, that's a black guy. But a high dissensus with regards to South Asian and white faces. This outcome does not contradict, and yeah, I mean, here's kind of a photo from the paper. This outcome does not contradict the intersectional bias that Gao and I, or even uh, Bolognini and Gebru find, but rather it showcases how each of the data sets on which these machines trained have distinct pragmatic ontologies of race. That is disparate taxonomies with different boundaries. So who classifies as white is an open question with these systems. Though you might think you are white, you too might someday be stopped in your tracks, wrongfully accused by an algorithm. I think that Khan and Fu's paper warrants a shift to thinking black atypicality as opposed to white prototypicality. Further, these recognition models are neither, you know, objective mind in themselves, as you know, some people want to say, or like general intelligence. Yet they show how even our data sets are objectified forms of our society, replete with normative rule governance, carnival mirrors of how society interfaces raced objects and who counts as what. And this, I think, shows how data and statistics now increasingly constitutes our social environment, one in which more and more people cannot appropriate. An environment that you cannot appropriate or make use of is uninhabitable. And a theory of institutional racism in a world underwritten by algorithms must begin at that point of friction and must consider how that friction, that uninhabitability feels. It's from the point of friction where we ought to derive the larger social system and not simply assume in advance the way in which our complex world works, whether as an organism or otherwise. We have to find that out in the, in the process of sociology. The feeling of digital epidermalization, of friction, of feeling invisible, of the world's uninhabitability should be the data of socio-technical ethics. As what's most immediate is this feeling. We all feel it, including the critic. And in that, the immediate may still be human society in the form of a, an immense collection of assets, as Marx would say, or 
and might even be society's preeminent asset in the Negro. Though, as Cameroonian philosopher Ashil Mbembe might say, our world today might have new Negroes, folks whose environments are by definition uninhabitable, climate refugees, the houseless, and now the Gaza. Even so, what's clear today is that the fact of the matter from which we must begin is that asset that goes into and comes out of machines. Thank you. All right, thank you for that talk. As we normally do, we are going to take 10 minutes so you can catch your breath, get some coffee. That means we'll get uh, back together for the Q&A at 5.30. Okay.